Hi, my name is Alexandra and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome to a lovely jaunt where we read better, not more. Today we're going to start a series on medieval literature. Last year I was able to read a few books in medieval literature and I fell in love with this area of sort of literary development, which is quite complex, more than I ever had before, and decided that I really, really want to spend some time focusing on this this year. I will be using the Norton Anthology of, let me actually read it, the Norton Anthology of English Literature of the Middle Ages. I believe I have like volume A or volume B or something like that. I'll have it linked in the show, or in the show notes. Can you tell that I've been listening to a lot of podcasts lately? I'll have it linked in the description down below. You don't have to use the Norton Anthology to study the Middle Ages, but I do really enjoy my anthologies that I have from my English degree. I find them to be very useful reference books, and we're going to use the same structure that they've presented here to kind of work through a whole bunch of the most important texts in the Middle Ages in the English language. So that means that we won't be reading things like, like Dante's Inferno or Boccaccio or people like that because we are focusing on literature that came that is written in the English language, not in Italian or German or something. For today's video, I am basically going to be doing a an overview on the movement and the literature and the context. So this is going to be kind of like the introduction to the whole thing. And then we will take a book, <laughs> they will take a book. And then we will take a look at other books and pieces of literature from this time. Okay, so let's begin with a timeline of the major events of this period. I'm going to be reading off of my tablet here. From about 43 uh, AD to 420 AD, you have the Roman invasion and occupation of Britain. By 450, you have the Anglo-Saxon conquest. In 597, St. Augustine arrives in Kent, and it's the beginning of the Anglo-Saxon conversion to Christianity. So there's an interesting little blip here in British history where the Christianized Roman government had already Christianized the area of Britain, and then Britain got taken over by the Germanic tribal groups of the Anglo-Saxons who were pagans. So the island primarily reverted back to a pagan belief system, although there were pockets of Christianity sort of up in the hills and that sort of thing. And so they had to be re-Christianized again, and that's again with famously St. Augustine arrives in Kent. From 871 to 899, you have the reign of King Alfred, also known as Alfred the Great. In 1066, you have the Norman Conquest, which is when you have the new French ruling class coming in and taking over England. From 1145 to 1189, you have the rule of King Henry II. In 1200, you have Oh, really the start of what we consider Middle English literature. Anything that kind of came before that would have been really, really similar to Dutch or to German, would be very hard for a modern reader to read. But Middle English is fairly readable. That's like the Chaucer type stuff that you might have read in high school. From 1360 to 1400, you have Geoffrey Chaucer, you have Pierce Plowman, Sir Gowan and the Green Knight is being published. And by 1485, you have William Caxton has now invented basically movable type, and he has done his first printing of Sir Thomas Mallory's Mort d'Arthur, which becomes sort of like the official canon of the Arthur stories. So let's start by asking the question, what is the Middle Ages? More, and this is a quote from the Norton Anthology introduction, it, quote, more recently there have been two non-exclusive tendencies in our understanding of the medieval period and what follows. Some scholars emphasize the continuities between the Middle Ages and the latter time, now often called the early modern period. Others emphasize the ways in which the 16th century writers in some sense created the Middle Ages in order to highlight what they saw as their own brilliance, so to highlight that difference between themselves and others. It's important to kind of keep in mind that we're covering a period of almost 800 years with huge linguistic shifts. There are shifts in culture as well and the type of literature that's created, huge shifts in the sort of dominant cultures that are influencing what is being published during this time and what is being created during this time. It's an extremely diverse period for literature. One th item that is really holding that continuity together is definitely the rule and power of the Catholic Church. This book divides the Middle Ages literature into roughly three periods, and we're going to follow that same structure. The first 
period is Anglo-Saxon lit, then you're going to have Anglo-Norman Anglo literature, and then finally Middle English literature. Again, another quote from the introduction. Literature in English was performed orally and written throughout the Middle Ages, but the awareness and pride in a uniquely English literature does not actually exist before the late 14th century. In 1336, Edward III began a war to enforce his claims to the throne of France. The war continued intermittently for 100 years, until finally the English were driven from all of their French territories except for the port of Calais. One result of the war and these losses was a keener sense on the part of England's nobility of their English heritage and identity. So let's take a look at that first period a little bit closer at the Anglo-Saxon history. From the first to the fifth century, England was a province of the Roman Emperor, and then Britons adapted themselves very closely to Roman civilization. The withdrawal of the Roman legions left the island very vulnerable to seafaring Germanic invaders, and the Anglo-Saxon invasion was extended over decades of fighting against the native Britons. By 597, St. Augustine was sent back to England as a missionary, and over time, the area became mostly Christianized again. Christianity was really key to literacy. Christianity was sort of the seed of bookmaking and the seed of this idea of the importance of reading and writing. Churchmen became uh, key historical figures, but also literary figures. For example, Bede, who wrote a Latin history of the English peoples. By the 9th century, new Germanic invasions by the Danes began sacking the coast. The Anglo-Saxons brought with them a tradition of oral literature. We don't really know what this oral literature was like exactly before the Christianity conversion, because most of the written records are done by monks and Christians who came into the area. And on top of that, they're much more interested in recording their own theological works or historical works that emphasize this uh, theological perspective. Because bookmaking was so expensive and so difficult to do with scribes doing it by hand on vellum and that sort of thing, the few books that they were able to produce were going to be mostly about their own interests. However, Germanic poetry continued to be performed orally throughout the community, and alliterative verse was very much the um, mode of expression. Rhyme really developed much later. A lot of Anglo-Saxon literature also shows this sort of aristocratic and heroic values, this sense of kingship among in the Germanic uh, society. And it's really similar to Homer's values, this idea of like leading men into battle and rewarding them with spoils. You can also take a look at my video on the conflict uh, of the Iliad. I always do this backwards. It will be either in this corner or in this corner. I don't know how these things work. And I'll link my video on the conflict of the Iliad, sort of explaining that system of values because it's very similar to what we see displayed in Germanic um, epic poetry as well. Christian writers like that of Beowulf were also fascinated by the distant culture of their pagan ancestors. And you feel this tension between this heroic code of glory and, I don't know, courage and all of those things with this sort of religion of humility that's emphasized by the Christian faith. Anglo-Saxon poetry often fuses these two systems of ideals and is dealing with this tension quite a bit. It is often elegiac, almost like looking with longing to the past. Romantic love appears hardly at all. Sorry if you're hearing my dog cry. We're taking my other dog for a walk. We can't take them both at the same time and so he's really sad that he's not getting a walk right now. It's pretty pathetic. Synecdoche and metonymy are two common figures of speech as well as kennings. Um, they have hundreds of poetic riddles that actually do survive from this period. I have another quote for you. Because a special vocabulary and compounds are among the chief poetic effects, the verse is constructed in such a way as to show off such terms by creating a series of them in apposition, known as variation. This gives the verse a highly structured and musical quality. Irony is also sort of core to the tragic and elegiac expression that happens in these poems, and especially the use of litotes. Another quote for you. The formal and dignified speech of Old English poetry was always distant from the everyday language of the Anglo-Saxons, and this poetic idiom remained remarkably uniform throughout roughly 300 years that separated Caedmon's hymn, 
which is from the very earliest period, to the Battle of Maldon. This clinging to old forms, grammatical and orthographic as well as literary, by the Anglo-Saxon church and aristocracy conceals from us the enormous changes that were taking place in the English language and the diversity of its dialects. I think that's a really interesting point. Because they're making stylistic choices that harken back to an older time, we aren't seeing the changes that are happening in everyday language. Now let's transition to talking about Anglo-Norman literature. Norman actually comes from the name Norsemen, so the Norse were raiding the coast of England and France, and finally France gave them a little corner of their coast, got named Normandy, and they integrated with the French people. They then conquered, as I said, England in 1066, and that meant that we had the presence of a French-speaking ruling class and an English-speaking common class, and that means that we're going to have huge ling linguistic and cultural changes. Four languages all together coexisted at the same time, Latin, which was the language of learning and theology, French, which was the language of the nobility and business and politics, which was somewhat intermingled with English, English for the common people, and even the Celtic languages in the various areas of islands of Scotland, Ireland, Wales, Wales etc. The Anglo-Norman aristocracy was especially attracted to the Celtic legends and tales, especially the, Rom the Arthur romances. And I mentioned this when I did my series of videos on Chrétien de Troyes' Arthurian romances, that there's a very strong sense that Chrétien de Troyes, um, Marie de France, and some of these other authors uh, is really taking the subject matter and the stories of Breton storytellers and transforming them into a French style. Geoffrey of Monmouth composed another English history in Latin, which was the foundation for the preeminence and the fascination with this King Arthur. It was likely composed from earlier Latin chronicles and Celtic oral traditions. Wace then later translated it from Latin into a French rhyme. Quote, the ethos of many romances, aristocratic and popular alike, involves a knight proving his worthiness through nobility of character and brave deeds, rather than through high birth. So we have this sort of egalitarian push. Much of the romance genre and poetry seeks to deal with the dialectic between religion and romance. So one of the things that you're seeing here is that there's two dialectics appearing in each of these periods. One is the dialectic between the heroic morals versus religious morals, and now between, you know, human romance and the religious ideals. All right, so now let's transition to talking about English literature of the 14th century. By the end of the 13th century, and really by the time of the 14th century, English was beginning to gain ground on French uh, as being the sort of dominant language for these artistic constructions. More works are being produced in English for those who didn't speak French or know Latin. And um, you're really seeing this transition even in the upper class of being exclusively French speaking to being bilingual, and then we're gonna see them as being pretty much English speaking only. The 14th century was devastated by war and disease, namely the bubonic plague. As a result of a scarcity of labor, you're going to have sudden social mobility and also as a result, popular discontent. Writers of this time like Chaucer never really re achieved the same kind of reputation that Chrétien de Troyes or Marie de France did in their own time. William of Langland was a contemporary of Chaucer and also refers to himself as sort of like a lower middle class person, which speaks to this experience of writers of the time not really being as well renowned. John Gower is a third major writer of this time. His earlier works are in French and Latin, but his final work, Confessio Amantis, was written in English, despite its Latin title. Uh, a few famous works like Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, which is probably one of my all-time favorite pieces of anything ever have unknown authors. And Julian of Norwich is famous for her visionary writings. It's really interesting to see Julian of Norwich and then later uh, Marjorie Kemp kind of meditate on this female experience of the Catholic Church and religious life. Literature of the 15th century. John Lydgate wrote poetry about his dream visions as well as books, as works based on French religious allegories and a poem based on the work of Boccaccio. 
Thomas Hockleaf is a contemporary of Lydgate who was writing during this time. Religious works of all kinds are, are continuing to be produced throughout the 15th century and really with much more oversight because we're having some dissent within sort of religious belief. You have the Lollards coming up is kind of the biggest movement at this time representing a contrary position to what the official Catholic Church is stating. And so when that comes up, obviously the counter position gets stronger. I mentioned, of course, Marjorie Kemp. She's really writing during the 15th century, and she even traveled to visit Julian of Norwich. And like I said, it really gives us a unique insight into the tentative ways in which these female uh, writers are trying to express their ideas with authority without overstepping any boundaries. Mystery plays were a huge thing, and that's basically plays about biblical stories. Sir Thomas Mallory gave the definitive English version of the Arthurian legends, which was then later printed by William Caxton, who introduced movable type to England. Movable type made books more accessible, which then resulted in more political and theological debate happening instead of just the works being transmitted and handed down, as previously mentioned, by monks usually working in monasteries, writing them by hand. This proliferation of text means that there's a proliferation of ideas. So as you can see, even in just this brief overview of the Middle Ages, it's extremely diverse, even within those three broad categories that we set out at the beginning. There's actually a vast quantity of literature being produced during this period, despite the fact that everything was made by hand up until the very end. We don't really talk about the Middle Ages being the Dark Ages any anymore, and this is why. We have a really quite a robust artistic movement, linguistic movement, thought movement, philosophical movement, and religious movement happening throughout these 800 years. If you have any questions about what we talked about today, go ahead and leave them in the comment section down below. Until next time, my name is Alexandra, and I'm still a bibliophile.